book of Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 12. Is everybody there? Shout amen. amen. Romans 8, beginning in verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, shout by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led, say it with me, by the Spirit, come on, by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided, notice this, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that as we begin to break the bread of life today, I pray that as I reach out my hands and I touch your people, that whenever I pull my hands back, that they will have the fingerprints of God on their life. Not that I've done anything, but that you touch them through me. And we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. You can be seated. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word today. Today, we're going to be continuing our series on the giver and his gifts. And as I said last Sunday, we were pouring some concrete. And today, we're going to pour a little bit more concrete. Is that all right? I want to lay a solid foundation for this series so as we develop it, everything is going to fit together. I love Tetris. It's frustrating piecing it all together. But once it's done and everything goes, it's like, yes. Yes, I am one of those OCD people. Yes, I am. Please forgive me. I'm, I'm so OCD that I changed the cover of my iPad to match the color of my shoes. Come on, somebody, pray for me. Pray for me. I know, I know. I'm just being real today. But we're going to be continuing our series on the giver and his gifts, and today we're going to be focusing on the work of the Holy Spirit through us to impact other people. Last Sunday, I talked about the Holy Spirit working in us, bringing order and correction to our life. But today, we're going to be talking about the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us to impact other people. My goal today is to focus on the power of the Holy Spirit to change the lives of others by way of working through us as the redeemed of Christ. Now, I, 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 need, I need to point out something here. People say, will the Lord touch them? Well, will the Lord touch them? Well, wait just a second. Could it be that that touch is actually you? We oftentimes pray, Lord, bless them. Lord, I pray that you'll work on them. Lord, I pray that you'll help them. But could it be that that prayer that you're praying, that you are actually the answer to that prayer for that person? The Holy Spirit being given to us for the sake of impacting the lives of of other people. My goal today is to focus on the power of the Holy Spirit working through us and so that others' lives can be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We must understand that in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, that it is clearly defined as what the purpose and the intent of the Holy Spirit was being given to us what was for. Say, say this with me, I was born again to be a witness. The Holy Spirit was given to us to make us a witness, to demonstrate the power of, of God and, through, and, and of his Christ. I want you to notice this in the text found in the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, no, notice now, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. Say power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And notice now, you will be my witnesses 
in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, I want you to say this with me. The Holy Spirit empowers me to be a witness. Say that again. The Holy Spirit empowers me to be a witness. And if we are to be a witness and to be enabled to live supernaturally, then we must understand a few points today according to what the Bible teaches us. Point number one, the, Holy, excuse me, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives should cause us to see the value of those around us. I'm going to say that again. The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives should cause us to see the value of those around us. Your impact on others is not measured by your anointing. Ooh. I'm going to say that again. Your impact on others is not measured by your anointing. I have met people who had anointings, but they had no impact. Your impact on others is not measured by your anointing, but rather by your insight and your awareness of those that, that, that you have influence over in the faith. I'll give you an example. You give a child a scalpel. He will hurt, harm, and damage. But you give a doctor a scalpel. He can mend, heal, and restore. Notice the anointing is effective or destructive based upon the insight and capacity of the one that is wielding it. This is the reason why you have to be careful whenever you begin to bring correction and instruction to the life of people. Because if we are not careful, we will be like the child and we will do more harm than good. But if we are, as Jesus said, as wise as a serpent, but yet harmless as a dove, we can be effective in the use of a tool that brings pain of correction, but it brings healing and restoration. The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives should cause us to see the value in those that are around us. I want you to notice with me in the 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth, and this is what he says in verse 7. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol. Notice this, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But notice this, any time that your Bible says therefore or but, you better pay attention. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge of eating in an idol's temple, will he not, excuse me, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by, notice this, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother to stumble." The Apostle Paul is leading us, or rather lends to us, the principle of insight in preferring our brothers above ourselves when it comes to matters of faith and conscience for the sake of all, shout all, progressing towards a solid foundation of faith in Christ. There are many things that are argued in this present hour whether it be doctrinal stances, eschatological perspectives, and even denominational differences. However, none of these things take precedence over the way in which that you live, the manner in which that you conduct yourself, and the things of which in your life that you prohibit or you indulge in as a direct or indirect impact on the lives of those that are around us. I'm going to make this personal. For myself, there are things that, that the Lord has redeemed me from, most of which my testimony I have openly di discussed, not from just other pulpits, but from the pulpit of this house. For myself, the greatest points of victory for me was the overcoming of drug and alcohol abuse, substance abuse. 
I've been clean now. I've been sober now for almost two decades. Thank God for the power of the Holy Spirit. I did not do that. The Lord did that. But notice now, confession and repentance are two different things. I can confess that I have a problem, but until I choose to repent, until I choose to metanoia, until I choose to make an about face and make some changes in my life to position me for the Holy Spirit to do in me what he's wanting to do, it takes more than just me admitting that I have a problem. It takes me submitting and turning my life over to him and allowing him to start to draw some boundaries in my life. In the reference to the uh, concrete pouring, here's the deal. Concrete only needs a form until it's dried. Concrete only needs a form until it's dried. If, if, if you're watching someone build a house, what do they do? They, you know, they dig the footings and then they lay the metal and they do all of these things and then they form it up and they brace it and they put dirt and they put the, all the plumbing and all the stuff in it. And then what do they do? They pump it full of concrete and then they finish it. And then after it's finished, they what? They let it set for a little while, notice, until it conforms itself to the parameters. And once that drying, once it is stable, once it is, has solidified itself, what do they do? They rake the forms. Because the forms are no longer necessary, notice now, because the concrete has already established itself in the formation. For me, in serving the Lord, it would be hypocritical for me to say that I have victory over the framework of what Christ has solidified in my life and then to turn and partake of the very things that I have victory over by the power of the Holy Spirit and say that though he gave me victory over it, I can still, I can tolerate this in my life now. Come on, somebody. Now, we can fight and argue over, well, alcohol consumption. Oh, I'm going there. But hang out with me, because this is not going to be what you think. We have preachers that preach against alcohol. We got preachers that preach for alcohol. We got preachers that say it's all right, and they go out to the pubs with, with their church people after service, and they, and they drink, and then you got others that are staunch prohibitionists. Listen to me. Well, that's legalism. Listen. Oh, Jesus. What did Paul say? He says, though I have the liberty and freedom of my conscience to do these things, I prohibit certain things from my life for the sake of my brother not being destroyed. So we can preach against it, or we can preach for it, or we can stand on principle and say there's certain things that for the sake of the gospel and my testimony of serving the Lord, that I don't need in my life, not so much that it's sin, but because it's principle. Because I don't want team challenge or soberness recovery, or some program coming to church here and seeing me lift my hands and speak in tongues and shout and run the altars and get a touch from the Lord and then see me at Chili's after church with a Budweiser on my table. I, I'm willing, listen now, I'm willing. Well, I don't think it's wrong. Well, I do think it's wrong. Pause. It's principle. It's not a matter of right and wrong. It's a matter of I love my brother enough that I'm going to protect my testimony for the sake of impacting them. Notice, because I have insight over their issues. It's hard for you to bring order to something in somebody else's life whenever what you're trying to, to correct runs wild in yours. This is the reason why Paul said, do you not judge those for thievery and yet you rob temples? What Paul was trying to reinforce is that it's not about your liberty, 
It's not about your opinion, and it's not about what you think about it. The bigger question that you need to ask is, is what I'm allowing in my life going to benefit his kingdom for the sake of impacting people to move forward in Christ? Or will I claim my liberty in Christ to be something that becomes a stumbling block for my brother? If I stand in a pulpit and say that Christ has given me victory over substance abuse, and then you see me with a beer in my hand, what are you going to think? Well, wait a second. Why did he need victory over something that he's now allowed back in his life? This is the reason why Jesus said, be careful of your life, or do you not know that a little, a little leaven goes throughout the whole lump? There's some things with the concrete forms that once we are formed and fashioned that we don't let in our life anymore. Well, that's legalism. You're not listening to me. It's not about being legalistic. It's about having insight for the sake of impacting people. And I have never counseled a marriage that, that said that alcohol made them better. Man, it sure has changed my life for the good. And furthermore, alcohol is a suppressant. Cocaine is an upper. I'm not going to ask how many of y'all have... Mm. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. We all have things that we need victory over. But there's some things in life that we just can't say, oh, well, it's not a sin to me, so they need to get over it. No, 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 no. Because could it be that it's not your neighbor that you're sinning against, it's your children that are not going to have the capacity that you've got. Well, it's a generational curse. Well, thank God for the power of the Holy Ghost in you. It stops with you. You have to understand that I was 14 years old. 14 years old. 14. One, four. 14 years old going into bars. Because I looked older than what I was. And I could drink most men under the table... Because my body did not process alcohol the way that everybody else's did. But guess what? My mom and daddy were the exact same way. And guess what? Their mommy and daddy were the exact same way. It was a generational curse. I refused to let that curse be upon my babies. Yeah. Well, pastor... After 20 years of being clean, don't, don't you think that you could just have one socially and you'd be all right? You're missing the point. Because most church people, if that happened, would crucify me. So if we're going to have principle over legalism, we have to understand that the standard of premise is for our life to be positioned in such a way that we live above reproach so we can have influence in the lives of people. This is the reason why Paul, whenever he was speaking to Timothy, he says, whenever you choose an elder or a deacon, one of the premises was this, let his life be above reproach and let him be respected by all. Why? Because if his life is not above re re reproach and if he doesn't have the respect of, of the community, he's going to have zero influence to help the church have an impact. Church family, the way you live matters. What you allow in your life matters. What you allow into your marriage matters. And if you missed this past Wednesday, I encourage you to go back and watch that service. And I've had some that, you know, some may, may not have appreciated or valued uh, some, of the, uh, some of the honesty and the candidness that Pastor Beck and, and Miss Jody brought. But I'm just going to tell you, thank God it wasn't me and Miss Ashley. As the, uh, the whole deal, whenever somebody's running for office, I approve this message. Well, I want, all, I want everybody to know that I approve of what was taught Wednesday. Because here is the premise. If you've got Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and Mama Burke affirming your message, <laughs> we're going to be all right. 
I need to move forward. Though we may feel that we have liberty to, to commit certain actions or to consume certain, certain things, the Apostle Paul gives us a clear directive regarding how our actions and lives can either help in the building up of another person or to destroy another person. Will I have liberty in Christ? Do not let your liberty become a destruction for somebody else. There are some things that whenever we serve the Lord, we simply do not do. There's places that we do not go. Well, pastor, that's old school preaching. You need to read your Bible because that's apostolic doctrine. It is not my intention to drive a legalistic view. As, well, you're preaching against alcohol. I'm preaching principle because we can argue opinion. But the principle is, is that if I allow things in my life that cause my brother's faith to stumble, then I'm not only sinning against Christ, I'm sinning against my brother. It's not my intent to drive a legalistic view here, but to simply state, it's hard to correct a broken life and help someone put it back together when we do not have the moral high ground to do so. Well, who are you to judge me? You did the same thing. How many of you would be willing to listen to somebody who, who has been married nine times try to give you marriage counseling? <laughs> well, wait, wait, wait. You're judging. You're judging people. No, 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 no. I'm not judging people. I'm looking at the fruit. If a doctor do does not have a very good report on having successful surgeries, do you think I'm going to put myself under the knife for that doctor to do a surgery? No! Why? Wait a minute, you're judging. No, I'm looking at fruit. I'm looking at success. I want people who have been successful in life, in ministry, and in marriage, that I give right of access to speak into my wife and I's relationship. That's wisdom. But what I'm not going to allow is somebody who has no right because of no successes in that area to have a voice to speak into something that they have no fruit to justify having a position to do so. That's why I say, if we're not careful, when we start tolerating things that are antithetical to what the Bible teaches, we no longer have the moral high ground to bring correction because we're guilty of doing the very things that we're trying to correct. Point number two, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives should cause us to bring healing to those that are around us. Your impact on others is not measured. Now listen to me. Your impact on others is not measured by your work in the church alone. But it's also by your work as the church on a daily basis. I'm going to say that again. Your impact on others is not measured by your work in the church alone. But also by your work as the church on a daily basis. Well, Lord, Pastor, I want God to move. I want the Lord to do amazing things in our services. I do too. But I also want to see God move in your marriage every day and through you on the job every day and empower you to raise your children in the way that you should. That is what I'm talking about as far as us as the church on a daily basis. Regrettably, the, the Pentecostal church has taught us a lot about how to speak in tongues in a church service, but, but we've not empowered you to do much more. Because we equate God moving quantified only to what he can do in a church service. I'm not after a church service, I'm after you as the church doing the work of the Lord. The Apostle Paul gives us insight into this very matter found in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, let me, let me just throw this out here. None of y'all are perfect. I know that you think that your babies are a godsend from heaven, but I've got some nursery workers and kids department leaders that would say otherwise. 
There ain't none of y'all perfect. Ain't none of y'all wake up in the morning speaking in tongues, levitating, and God tells you what color socks to wear. So stop. That's foolishness. Well, Lord, the Lord told me to order a number one, a Whopper with a biggest size and a fry. No, you should have went, went to Nukes and got a salad in Jesus' name. <laughs> I'm going to hank you wave myself on that one. Hey, look at this. Hey, y'all laugh. I couldn't wear this jacket the end of October. And now I can button it. Now that is success. Praise the Lord. So, I appreciate all of the positive affirmation in the room today. But notice, what did Paul say? He says, brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, guys, Stop using the excuse of church hurt because church did not hurt you. Well, I was hurt by the church. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. You were hurt by people that are just as messed up as you are. Now, does that justify their actions? No. But at some point, we've got to stop using the excuse, well, I'm not going to church because, you know, because I got church hurt. No, no. Not necessarily always. I dealt with some people who claim church hurt, but it wasn't church hurt. It was butt hurt because your pastor had spine enough to correct you. I read a post this past week, and it spoke to me. It was another pastor that actually posted this. He said, I do not want a pastor who has a PhD. I'm simply looking for one who has a spine. I said, Lord Jesus, let that let that be let that be a moniker of this next generation of young preachers who are not afraid to tell the truth of God's word guys we're going to make a mistake i'm just going to go ahead and say this i love you but i will fail you and i will not do it intentionally nobody wakes up and says you know what i sure do want to do something stupid today to make a whole bunch of people mad at me <laughs> if you do there's something wrong with you nobody wakes up and says man i sure do want to just do something to just totally wreck everything nobody does that notice paul says listen if anyone is caught in a transgression if anybody makes a mistake it's going to happen you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Notice this, but keep watch on yourself, lest you do be tempted. Bear, notice this, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks, notice this, oh Lord Jesus, for all of the religious spirited folk that think that they are God's first cousin, verse 3 is for you. For if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Oh, Lord, Holy Ghost, say that one more time. Put it on repeat one more again. For if anybody thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one, notice this, let, let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will, will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. I want you to pay close attention to the second half of verse 1. You who are spiritual should restore him. Say, say that with me. You who are spiritual should restore him. Notice it doesn't say you who speak in tongues 24-7. Or you who claim to be a prophet. No, 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 no. It says, you who are spiritual should restore him. We have become so consumed in modern-day evangelicalism with the manifestation of gifts that we quantify spirituality with the manifestation of a gift. But I have met folks who know how to speak in tongues but yet still cuss out their family. I have met people who could prophesy over cornflakes and tell the truth, but yet still not be, be faithful to their wife. Oh, Holy Ghost. All you got to do is look at the modern day news system to see how the infrastructure of the modern day church is being caught in an absolute hypocritical lie. You who are spiritual should restore him. You want to show me a truly 
spiritually mature church, it does not have its definition in the number of prophets and tongue talkers and hand layers on its ministry role. A true spiritually mature church has the adaptability to lay hold of people's lives that are messy and nasty and broken and full of bad de decisions and bondages and addictions and help them as a master garden tender to by the power of the Holy Spirit begin to snip away things from their life to bring formation back to something to make it fruitful again. Point number two, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives causes us to bring healing to those that are around us. We make a fatal mistake in thinking that the anointing is given to us to benefit us. My Lord Jesus, the anointing was not given to you for you. I said it last Sunday. The Holy Spirit is not a badge of honor for you to be worn about because you think that you're such a much. You're not such a much. You were nothing apart from Christ. And he gave you the power of the Holy Spirit, not because he was proud of you, but because he's abundantly aware of the mess that you can make out of your life whenever you're left to your own decisions. Jesus said, I got to go. But I'm going to make sure that my Father sends you the Holy Spirit. Notice now, and he will lead you into what? All truth. And truth brings correction. Oh, Lord. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is to equip us to be beneficial to his kingdom, not to enable us to build our own. And a part of being beneficial is being equipped by the power of the Holy Spirit to perform the tasks of helping people within and without of the kingdom to be restored. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 2 verses 1 through 6 regarding those who fall into sin. Listen, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Notice, what is he saying? He says, I'm trying to bring order. I'm trying to bring correction. I'm trying to help you here. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this, we know that we have come to know him. Notice this, if we keep his what? Commandments. Whoever says, I know him. Now, pay, pay attention, verse 4. Whoever says that I know him, but, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and, and the truth is not in him. Those are strong words, but that's real, folks. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is what? Perfected. By this we know, excuse me, by this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him, notice, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. There's a standard to this thing. John says, listen, if you claim to know him, but there's no premise of the law of the mirror of you looking like him, not perfection, because nobody will ever be able to do that, but for there to be fruit unto righteousness sake, for people to know that, that he's been with Jesus. Listen, somebody. Peter is trying to deny the fact that he doesn't know the Lord. And what does the woman say? She says, sir, I know that you have been with him, for even your speech betrays you. She's saying you can't deny that, that you've been with him because you talk like him. There's something about your life... Peter is trying to deflect and say that he doesn't know the Lord. She says, sir, even your speech betrays you. There's a fruit to this thing that people are going to begin to see. I want to draw your attention to two points. First off, if you sin, there is forgiveness to be found in confession and repentance. 
And secondly, there is a standard to this thing regarding the dimensioning of the commandments. And the Apostle John instructs us, notice now, if we claim to know Christ, but do not live according to what he has taught, then we are liars and the truth of God is not in us. I want you to say this with me. There is a standard that my testimony requires of me. There, there's a standard. You know, it's interesting to me, I believe it was in the book of Acts, it says that it was in Antioch that the people, the community, the city, saw the way that Christians conducted themselves. The early church did not call themselves Christians. The community around them saw there was something different and they identified it. You should never have to walk around and say, I'm a Christian. People should naturally be able to look at your life and see that there's something different about you. There's something different about you. There should be something different. People should even on the job, whenever everything is falling apart, you should be the one with peace and leadership of the Holy Spirit to be able to, to speak truth into a matter for the sake of helping and moving things forward. The, the apostles Paul spoke on this very matter concerning the restorative work of the Holy Spirit in his lives and in the lives of others whenever he broke to his son in the faith, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, I want you to notice what, what Paul says here. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ our Lord, because he has judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Notice, say it with me, his service, not yours. He says, I thank God that he counted me faithful. He appointed me unto his service. He did that. I didn't choose this. He chose this for me. Though formerly I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and I was an insolent opponent, notice this, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Church family, every one of you in this room, including all of you watching by TV and on the internet all around the world, every one of you have things in your life that only you and God know that you did. There are things that you will have to live the rest of your life with knowing that only you and God know about it. And Paul says here, he says this is a trustworthy saying and it is full of acceptance that Jesus came to die for sinners of who I am the foremost. Paul is trying to get his son in the faith to understand that there are things in my life that Christ has redeemed me from that nobody else knows about. Paul says, I'm the foremost. There's things that Jesus has forgiven me of that even you don't know about. There are things that I am ashamed of that Christ has redeemed me from. Verse 16, notice this. He says, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, that Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. I thank God that the same patience that Jesus had for Paul, he had for you and me. I thank God that Jesus didn't just say, you know what, my patience has ran out. I'm done with you. What did he say here? He says, but in a display of his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. Lord God, I'm so thankful that he gave me mercy. And I'm so thankful that he was patient with me. And he was long-suffering with me. And he didn't give me the right foot of fellowship when I deserved to be given the right foot of fellowship. Come on, somebody. There, I'm thankful that his perfect patience was made manifest in me for the sake of those who are afar off. Notice in verse 17, to the king of the ages, immortal, 
invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to close this point with the following statement, and I'm running out of time. Can, can I have five more minutes? Can I just preach just a little bit longer? I need to get through this today. I want to close point number two with this following statement. The anointing doesn't have anything to do with you. When we make the anointing about us, we remove his super from our natural. You were not anointed for the sake of your benefit. He anoints you for the sake of his benefit. He did not give you the Holy Ghost so you could run around and beat your te- chest and talk about how great you are. No, 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 no. He gave you the Holy Ghost to bring order and correction to your life. And so that through that, you could have the ability to impact people who had the same struggles as what you had. And many of us still have. The early church used to say it this way. They would say, I'm on the way. I'm on the way. They would not even refer to themselves as Christians because they did not feel that their life qualified with the example of being referred to as a Christian. So they would just simply say, I'm on the way or I am in the way or I'm in the process of going in the way. There is a purpose to this thing. The anointing was not given to you for the sake of you. It has everything to do with him. You are anointed because of what he did not because of anything that you have done. Hear me, church family, from the point of being born again to the point of dying in Christ and being escorted into the throne room of God, every bit of that has everything to do with what he did and not what you did. The Bible even goes as far as saying that if the Holy Spirit had not drawn you unto repentance that you would have never even been born again. The the simple fact that you are born again and you're in love with Jesus today is that God cared enough even while you were yet afar off from Him. He sent the Holy Ghost to start messing with you. Some of y'all can't even backslide good. I remember many years ago, there was a certain individual whose mama was a preacher. We were all mixed up in the same stuff and running the same life and making all the same bad decisions. And I can remember it never failed that the more things he did in sin, the more apt he was to preach. I can remember this guy literally being stoned out of his mind and preaching to everybody. Quoting scripture, there's more to life than this. If we died right now, we're going to go to hell. Nobody wanted him to come and hang out with them anymore because he was a downer. But isn't it interesting that some of us can't even backslide good? There was a time where some of you, you you were so on fire with passion and loved Jesus that you were birthed out of a white hot move of the Holy Ghost that you knew that God had done something in and through you that nobody would be able to take away from you. But because of the cares of this life and the things that have happened in relationships that you've had or failed or what, what have you, that there's been water of this life and things have been thrown on top of it to try to snuff out what, what God is doing. But I want to remind you of what, of what Paul said. He said, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me unto his service. Though though formerly I was a blasphemer and I was a persecutor and I was an insolent opponent of, of his, I received mercy. But I received mercy. I am thankful for his mercy today. And if you don't know his mercy today, I want you to know what it is to know his mercy. You need to be born again. Well, pastor, I'm struggling in this area of my life or in that area of my life or I've got this sin or that sin or this thing or that thing. Good, you need to be born again. Well, pastor, this is a generational curse. Good, you, you, you need to, to be born again. Pastor, I am trapped in this and this is now my identity. No, it's not. You need to be born again. 
One thing that I've learned is that I could either identify my, myself as someone who is a recovering addict or I could identify myself as somebody who had victory in Jesus' name. And I refuse. How lunacy. How much lunacy would it be for me to walk around and say, well, I've been sober for 20 years, but I'm just an old alcoholic. No, I'm not. I'm blood washed. I'm sanctified. I'm Holy Ghost filled. I love the Lord. I have a calling and a purpose in this life. And bondage and addiction and brokenness and shame will not be the title of who I am. My children are not going to know me as who I was. My babies are going to rise up and say that I will be honored to serve the God of my fathers. I'm not going to allow the mistakes of my yesterday to become the headline of my life. I'm born again. Am I perfect? No, but I'm born again. I remember, come on somebody, I remember who I was apart from Him, but I now know who I am with Him. I have been raised in Christ my name is written come on somebody my name has been written in his book i'm no longer my own well pastor why do you get so fired up because there's so many people who don't know the lord and do but they still allow sin and bondage and shame to be their title well pastor i'm tore up i'm struggling i've got this and that good you need to be born again well, pastor, I've, I rebelled and I walked away from God and I'm backslidden. Good. You need to be born again. You mean, you mean to tell me I need to? Yes, you need to do your first works all over again. You need to fall back in love with Jesus. Salvation unlocks the door to your life to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and start bringing order. You know, whenever my wife and I moved in this past year, we were packing our house up. We were getting ready to move, and she went over before everybody else did. So notice the house we're moving to is empty. And as we began to move stuff in, my wife was in the house. That goes here. Put that there. That goes to this room. That goes to the kitchen. That goes. Notice, what was she doing? She was bringing order to what was being brought into the house. Salvation opens the door to let the Holy Spirit come into your life and start to bring order. Hey, you don't need that. Let me move this. I know that, I know that that's painful, but let me work on that. Hey, let's sweep this floor. Let's mop this area. You don't need that. Don't even let that in the house. Put that in the dumpster. If you'll let me, I will start to place things where they need to go. Notice, because it's not about having a house. It's about having a house that is functional to be occupied by the Lord. In Matthew, I believe it's Matthew chapter 15. I, I need to hurry up. In Matthew chapter 15, the Bible says that Jesus is talking about the uh, demon being cast out. And what does he say? He says, whenever you speak to the demon and cast it out, you command it to go to a dry place. The house shall be swept, brought in order, but if it's not occupied, that demon will say, did I not come from a place that had source, I will go back to my house and he will bring seven worse off than himself and the latter state of that man shall be worse than his former state. Notice now, salvation and victory opens the door and lets the Holy Ghost in, but if we don't let him occupy our mortal dwelling, if we don't let Christ have his perfect will in our life, I'm challenging you, I'm warning you, I'm trying to guard you if you're not careful. What the Lord has given you victory over will try to come back and it will try to reoccupy the house that it used to call home. 
But if the Holy Ghost is there, if the giver and his gifts are resident in the house, gentleness and peace and self-control and power and authority and manifest presence, if the Holy Ghost is there, it can't come back. I feel like preaching longer than I got time to preach. We just need to expand to a three-hour church service and y'all just bring a bucket of chicken to church. I got to get here and I'll close. The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives should cause us to reach those who are around us. Your impact on others, hear me now, is not measured by your word, but by your deeds. The fruit of your life will always speak louder and longer than any sermon or any statement that you will ever make. This is why your testimony is so powerful. Because notice now, it allows others to associate and connect with you because they realize that they're not alone in their struggle. I've had people ask me, why are you so open and vocal and vulnerable about the broken areas of of your life? Doesn't that make you uncomfortable? Initially, yes, because I was afraid of religious spirits. But then I got a revelation out of the book of the Revelation. Imagine that, a revelation from, from Revelation. The Bible says that the testimony of Jesus is as the spirit of prophecy. The Holy Spirit can use the broken places of your life to impact other people because it's just a simple reminder that what has scarred you did not kill you. And there are people in this room that have had all kinds of things that God has given them victory over. You pick your poison. I've counseled y'all. Everybody in this room had something that Jesus delivered them from. This is why your testimony is so powerful. It allows people to personally experience the gospel by looking at your life. You mean to tell me that you dealt with that? Sister such and such dealt with that? Brother such and such dealt with that? You mean to tell me that that is your testimony? That God redeemed you out of that? I had no idea. I'm going to tell you something. I thank God for the things that Jesus has redeemed us from. In closing, Jesus stated this, and I promise this is my fifth and final closing. Jesus states in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand and it gives light to all that are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. Notice now, note, note here. It did not say, hear your good words. It said, see your good deeds, your good works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus, according to this passage, is instructing us to let our light shine and impact others and so that our good deeds shall speak on behalf of our testimony of Christ and people will turn to the Lord because of what God has done in and through you. There are people that heaven intends for you to impact. Step up and start impacting people for heaven's sake. The fruit of your life causes people to be impacted. Church family, it's time for us to recommit and lay aside every weight. Yes, this is a get right with God message. It is time for us to throw aside every weight and sin and bondage and shame and place of brokenness. It's time for us to cast that off and commit to a daily consistency of life and godliness and righteous living as we serve the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Church family, I want people to look at my life and say, Jesus has done something in that man. 
He's not perfect. But Jesus has done something in that man. I want you on the job and in your home and with your children and with your family for people to be able to look at you and say, you know what, man? You're not the the same guy that I knew a year ago. Thank God. Praise the Lord. No, I'm not. Let me just tell you about how good God has been. I know some people might, well, I don't know about it. I just don't want to push my religion on people. You're not pushing your religion. Folks watch commercials every day. A testimonial report on such and such. I took this and it worked great. Philly, for whatever, 32 years old. I took this medicine and it was wonderful. Why? They are lending testimony to what they're pushing to get you to buy into it. Some people need to know of what God has done in you. Well, I don't want to push my religion. You're not pushing your religion. You're telling them about what God has done in and through you. I know I'm preaching long. Praise the Lord. May we all commit today to this goal together as a church family. As the Lord continues to work in and through us to impact our community, our city, our state, and our world. Church family, you listen to me. And you hear me by the Holy Ghost. The king is coming. The king is coming. The master of the house is going to return. And he's coming soon. Well, pastor, that's old and foggy and they've been saying that. You better listen to me. There's never been a time in 2,000 years of church history that more prophetic declaration is coming to pass than it is right now. And Jesus said, whenever you see these things begin to happen in the earth, you better look up and set your nose as a flint because your redemption is drawing nigh. Church family, as things in that world out there get darker, the light of the gospel should shine brighter in his church just as it was in the book of Exodus. When there was darkness in Egypt, there was light in Goshen. When darkness falls in that world out there, people are going to be looking for a light and that light is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus said let that light ever shine before all men that they might look at your life and say God has done something in you I just caught my my second wind so y'all better get on and order some food to be brought to the church today church family the king is coming the king is coming And as the pastor of this church, as the friend of the bridegroom, I'm doing my best to get the church ready for his return. Because church family, every eye shall see him. And when he descends from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and those of us that are alive and remain we shall call up to meet meet with the Lord in the air and forever shall we be with him people want to fight over pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib listen, I want to be on the first bus out of here come on somebody I want the Lord to come and I want him to redeem his church out of this earth and I want to, to see all that God has planned for the future but we had better get ready for his return.